minutes. And um, if the men in the congregation would like to, to uh, come a little closer to the front of the auditorium, uh, you will uh, please feel welcome. We're going to be, I want this kind of to be more of a an interactive session. Uh, I, I really would love to have your feedback. Uh, you feel free to a ask any questions during this session. This is the application of the seminar. What do I do with all that information that you have taught in the last uh, five lessons? So we're looking forward to tonight. And uh, if you've not already signed to get Reaching the Lost, that will come out tomorrow morning. It will be sent right to your email box at exactly 7 o'clock a.m. If you've not done that, raise your hand because I'll make sure this gets to you. This is important. This is part of the evangelism training. You want this to come to your email box because it is going to engage you personally so that you can reach lost souls. I see a brother over there, uh, Caleb, do you mind? If you, if you just indicate to Caleb, if, uh, if you've not already signed up for reaching the lost, we'll make sure to get those email addresses into our system even tonight. My wife, as we tr were traveling home, She'll be entering those email addresses. Uh, my daughter has worked on reaching the lost literally all day long. And uh, it is a huge um, um, part of our, our training. It is uh, taking the reports of all the churches, putting them together into a, a newsletter. You can read it every week. We don't give monthly, quarterly, yearly, semi-annual reports. We give weekly reports. Uh, you're going to get an instant indication as to whether or not what you're doing works. Um, we're going to send a report card on every church enrolled in the, in the school. So there's some accountability. And uh, I know that we work well when we have benchmarks and we have metrics and we have goals and we have um, you know, uh, um, numbers that we're trying, to, we're trying to reach. And I'm sure you have those at your place of employment. I, if, you, if they're not written down, they're in your head. Whether you're farming or whether you're in industrial complex, or whether you're manufacturing, whether you're not you're in a, a sales of some sort, uh, whether or not you're a, you're a marketing, technology, they're metrics. And you're trying to meet those metrics because those metrics determine success or failure. And uh, in your world, failure means you lose your job. And um, I don't know what failure looks like or what it means in the church of Christ, um, but I can tell you what it results in. It results in declining church membership. And um, so we, we just can't afford failure any longer. So we're going to have to have some metrics, and I'm going to provide those metrics um, as we move forward. Um, again, if you have a question, you, you feel free to raise your hand. I don't, I don't mind at all answering the questions. I am a lecturer, so once I get wound up, sometimes you have to really get my attention to get me to stop. All right. It was... Um, it was uh, I think February of 2020, and um, COVID uh, set in around mid-March, and uh, we were uh, out of action for about a month and a half. And after that month and a half, we uh, we hit the road. I mean, it's wide open. We literally crisscrossed the country. We went from uh, as far west, northwest as Idaho, far northeast as New Hampshire, Florida, Texas, and in between Nebraska, training churches of Christ. And it was about August, and uh, we, were, we were pretty worn. And I said, Nicole, I said, our anniversary is about to come. And I said, why don't we just take a couple days and just uh, do something fun as a family? She said, sounds good. What do you have in mind? I said, we're supposed to go to St. Mary's, Georgia. And I understand there's some good fishing in St. Mary's, Georgia. I said, I've always wanted to go deep sea fishing. I said, uh, I said would, would it be okay for our anniversary to go deep sea fishing? You know, pretty brave of a husband, isn't it? And he said, uh, she said, yeah, I'd like to try that. I said, wow, I got the green light. So I called the brethren at St. Mary's. I said, uh, brother, I said, I want to do some deep sea fishing. I'm going to come in a couple of days early. I said, uh, what do you, you reckon you know somebody that do that? He said, son, you come to the deep sea fishing capital of the world. He said, in fact, some of the best captains um, live right around St. Mary's. And, I, and the good news is that COVID has pretty much shut their industry down. So they're just begging for somebody to, to charter. So he gives me this captain's number and I call him. He said, man, absolutely. I said, sounds good. I said, captain, I said, uh, I said, what time do you want me to be out there and uh, to, to, to pick us up at the dock? He said, he said, hey, about three o'clock. I said, man, you must be really good. That doesn't give us a lot of sunlight. He said, no, son, three in the morning. I said, all right, three in the morning. And I said, I said, captain, I said, I, you know, it's kind of dark at three o'clock in the morning. How am I going to know it's you? He says, uh, son, I'll be the only one out there. I said, all right, that's fair enough. I said, so, 
So I said, uh, Nicole, now 3 o'clock in the morning, we're going to be at this dock, you know. And I said it real quickly, like, you know. And so we got out there, and it got, he, 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 it's just him and his first mate. Pretty good-sized boat, a 27, 28-foot boat. And um, so we get out there, and, and he says, you guys hunker down. It's going to be a while. So we hunker down, and he's taking us on out right into the, into the ocean. You know, we're going way out there. You know, he says, it's going to be hours. So we're, we're going and going, and, uh, you know, sun, the sun's starting to break uh, um, across, the, um, across the horizon. And uh, the sun comes up, and all of a sudden he stops. He said, okay. He says, time to get the bait. I said, where is it? He says, you're going to catch it. And I said, okay. He's got this little scanner and sonar. And he's got some very high-tech equipment in his boat. And uh, so he's talking to us. He's, uh, he's, I got him. He said, all right, put your, put your lines down. We're putting our lines down. He said, now, when I count to, to three, pull them up. One, two, three. Pull them up. And we pulled I mean, there were bait fish everywhere. This it's, it's in, is incredible. And um, I mean, he, he's got my attention. He knows what he's doing. So we take the, I don't know if it's chat or something. We take it off the line, you know, we put it in the live well. He said, all right, son, hunker down. We got a little bit more to travel. So we travel another hour. We're still going away. I, I can't see anything, you know. He says, all right, guys, we're here. He says, now, I said, Captain, I want to get the big stuff. He says, that's why I'm here, son. He said, what do you want? I said, I want the big fish. He said, you want to go first? And I said, sure. He said, buckle him in. Brother, when they, buck, when they say buckle you in, you're going to get something big, right? So they put me in a chair. They buckle me in. They put that line out there. My family's all watching videoing this, you know. And uh, so we put it out there. And he says, all right, son. He, says, he said, I see it. Seven, six. He's counting down. Five. He's literally counting down. Two. He said, there it is, son. Pull. And I pulled. And I'm telling you, my line, it, my pole just bent down like this. Keep it straight, son. Keep it straight, you know. And, he, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, his first mate is sitting right next to me watching everything I do. And he says, hold on, son. Don't let. So I'm, I'm starting to reel in, you know. I mean, it was a real battle. And I can see this fish way out there, you know. I said, man, this is amazing. He says, son, you got a kingfish. There's a reason they call it kingfish. And here it comes. It's coming, get closer and closer. And I mean, he, we're about to, it's huge. We're about to bring it into the boat. All of a sudden, a barracuda. There's a reason it's called a barracuda. It came right across, took half my fish with it. It was, it was an incredible day. By 2 o'clock, we had caught in our limit. And we're going in. Brother, that captain knew his, that captain knew his trade. He knew everything there was about it. He knew what kind of pole to use. He knew what kind of fishing lure to use. He knew what kind of bait to use, hook to use. He had the right equipment. He knew how to use the equipment. He had spent countless hours reading the magazines, watching the videos, live experience in order to capture just a few hours of unforgettable moments in our life. He knew his trade. I think there's some men tonight. Let's just be honest, men, where our women are out there with my wife. Let's, let's just have an honest conversation between us. I think there's some men in our audience tonight who are more capable of going out there and getting the big buck. And you're more equipped and you're more excited and you're more motivated. And brother, you'll spare no expense. You'll go out there and get your gear stand. You'll, get your, you'll spare no expense on your rifle. You'll get the latest technology you can get. You, not only we got deer cameras, we got cellular deer cameras. Man, they're going to beam it right to your phone. You don't even have to put a, put a card in your, in your computer anymore. It dings you. Here, there's the big 601. There he is. Be out there. There are some of us tonight, we're more equipped to go get the catfish than we are to save a soul. Brethren, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. That I'll ever never be named among us again. May we never, this day forward, may we never be more prepared to go fishing and hunting than we are to go get lost souls. The culture of our churches has got to change and it's got to start changing right now. We're soul saving. We're going out there and trying to reach lost people in your community, your neighbors, people you grew up with. That becomes the number one mission of every child of God. And not until that day happens at a local church of Christ are you going to see any difference. Yes, I know it's exciting to focus on souls. But if we don't turn what you've learned into something actionable, this will fail like a July 4th fireworks show. It will drizzle away, and you're going to go back to the only life you know, which is the routine that most of us enjoy in the churches of Christ every single Sunday. I did not come to keep the status quo. 
Brethren, we came because there are changes that must be made at the local level. It's going to be the most difficult thing you've ever done. I'm going to challenge your elders and preacher unlike they've ever been challenged before. But I'm telling you, if this moves forward, and if we can put all of our efforts and focus on trying to develop a congregational plan to reach into our communities to save souls, you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. And I pray God not. Winston Churchill was walking towards the commons of Great Britain and he knew he had one shot. Chamberlain had made a mess of the war effort. He was an appeaser. He was, he, he, he was just itching to come to terms with peace with Adolf Hitler. The German army had just rolled right across France. I mean, things were just terrible. And uh, Prime Minister, or, or before he became Prime Minister, just a delegate Winston Churchill knew that if we don't change the course right now of what we're doing in this country, we're going to lose this war. He gives one of the most historic speeches that's ever been recorded in world history. If you've never listened to it, you need to. Because they'll stir your spirit. And he stood before the commons, he stood before those delegates, and if they had taken a vote prior to his speech, he had lost. And brother, he made a speech that went right into the soul of every person that was there. And they saw it. They saw it with their own eyes. If we don't engage right now, we're going to lose our country. And they made him prime minister. And that decision, right in the beginning of World War II, was critical to winning the war. Brethren, I'm, I'm appealing to you in every way I know how. I'm not Winston Churchill. And I don't have the great oratory skills that that man had, but I can say this this evening. We have got to change what we're doing. Not change our doctrine. But we're not going to be able to go back to the status quo. That congregational plan is very important. In that speech, Winston Churchill said, he who fails to plan is planning to fail. And unfortunately, I think that's where we're at. Number one, what's the first thing you need? You got to get the equipment to do the job. Brethren, if you do not have the equipment to do the job, you cannot evangelize. It's, it's vital that we have Bibles that we can use for Bible studies. You know, we spare no expense sending them to India. But we've got to have Bibles in our church buildings for, not pew Bibles. I'm talking about Bibles for Bible studies, like giant print Bibles. We ought to have a stack of those things. We ought to have large print every, we ought to have Bibles just wait. How about Bible study methods like back to the Bible. We should not have to order that from Gospel Advocate. I promise when it comes to our fellowship meals, we don't have to order coffee pots, coffee stirs, coffee cups, coffee grinds, coffee maker, coffee creamer. We don't have to order coffee pots. We, we have everything we need to have our coffee. And we have forks, knives, spoons. We have all the silverware we need to eat. We have pepper and salt. We've got plates, plastic plates, plastic forks. We've got tables and chairs and tablecloths and ovens and microwaves and refrigerators. I believe we have everything we need to open a soup kitchen. My question tonight is this. Do we have what it takes to evangelize? I think some of our churches are better equipped to start a school or a daycare than they are to evangelize. In fact, I know that. I walked up to a church one day. I said, brother, I said, do you have any... Uh, I was early, and he was one of the elders, and, and we were having a friendly conversation. And I said, brother, I said... Would it be okay if we just talked just for a minute and I could kind of gauge the level of readiness of this church? He said, absolutely. I said, brother, I said, I'm a church member. I've come to you and i got a neighbor. He wants to have a Bible study. I said, take me to where your Bible study material is. He didn't have it. I said, what do we use? He said, oh, but Br Brother Whitaker, I knew you were coming. He says, so I, I got prepared. He said, follow me. He got excited. He got his keys out. He's jingling his keys. We walk down this long hallway. We finally turn, we're turning the lights on as we go down the hallway. We finally get to the end of the hallway. On the right-hand side, there is a, there is a, um, there's a door. He said, they're in here, Brother Whitaker. It was locked. Don't worry, he had the ring of keys. We brought them out. We went through all the keys. We got into the room. And he said, Brother Whitaker, they're on the back side over there in that cabinet. We went to the cabinet. Of course, it was locked. We brought out the ring keys a second time, went through all the keys. We got into the locker, went into the top shelf, pulled them out. We had one stack of back to the Bible. He said, Brother Whitaker, we're prepared. I said, Brother, I have a question for you. I want to know why the material that's needed to do a Bible study is locked in a room and locked in a, a locker. He said, oh, well, we were afraid someone might get them. Brother, isn't that the point? Don't we want them to get them? 
If you're going to have the materials, if we're going to get the materials like believe the Bible, materials for bringing people, teaching people, new converts and material, where do you suppose they need to be? Step one, equip the saints. Step one, get the materials, but why don't we put it out there where people can get them? Why is it in the library? Why is it locked in the preacher's office? Why is it in the elders' conference room? Why isn't it out there in the foyer or somewhere in an auditorium, clearly marked, that says, go get it? One of the very first steps we encourage a church to do after they get the materials is to put the materials out there where people can get them. Get yourself a tablecloth, uh, 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 Put your, put your name of your church, put, put Fayette Church of Christ on it. Stick that material on that table and make sure your members, I'm talking about all your members, not just your deacons, not just the elders, but I'm talking to everybody, young people, older people, have access to the materials they need and actually to do a Bible study. Because if we don't give access to our members to the equipment, they're not going to use it. We have to display it. I was, uh, I just finished a seminar several years ago and, uh, Congregation, actually, it's not too far from here. You draw a one-hour radius, you probably include it. I'm going to tell you what happened. And um, they, they got the equipment, they got all the materials, and they, they, they were putting it out there, and the preacher was excited, and he said, man, Rob, he said, we're ready to work. And I said, great. I said, well, let me know how it goes. Three days later, he calls me. He said, Rob, I went to that evangelism table, and guess what? He said, it was gone. I said, brethren, that's wonderful. The brethren are hungry. He said, oh, no, Rob. <laughs> he said, that's not it. He said, I put it out again, and I came back two days later, and it was gone again. He said, I began to become suspicious. He said, so I decided I was going to call one of the, the, the elders and say, Brother, what's going on with all that uh, material out there? You know, we got all that material out there. Where is it all at? He said, now, nah, brother, don't get too excited. But now, you know, when we built this $2 million facility, we, uh, we uh, had an agreement as to what goes in the foyer and what doesn't. And he says, and, uh, you know, we only wanted matching decor. Now, that gaudy-looking table of yours, he said, one of the ladies complained, and she was right. We did not agree that that was going in the foyer. She said, why in the world is that out here? So we decided, in order not to cause problems in the church, what we should do is just put it in the coat closet. He said, brother, it took everything I had to be agreeable. He said, but I said, if that's where they want it, if they think it's best served in the coat closet... It's a large coat closet. We put it in the coat closet. And he said, now I preached on Sunday night as I was supposed to on the materials. And I, I told the church, you know, this is what's out there. This is, what you're, this is what's available. And I explained all the various uh, functions of it. And Rob, he says, I got out of the pulpit. I walked back and I stood outside that coat closet waiting for the brethren to get them. Guess how many members walked in the coat closet to pick them up? Zero. Brethren, if we cannot put evangelism materials in our auditorium for our church members to pick up, may I suggest we sell our buildings and go home. This is the Church of Christ. This is not the Rotary Club. This is not the Lions Club. We have a mission, and our mission is to reach souls in our community that are lost. And if we cannot put evangelism materials in our church buildings where members can have access to them and see them, we have a huge problem. You might say, well, Brother Whitaker, that's just a fluke. It happens, it's happened three times in the last four years. I've had three preachers call me and say they would not allow the materials out there because it didn't match the decor or it just looked gaudy. Number three, what good is the material if you don't train the brethren? One of the initial steps I'm going to encourage you guys to take is you need to train this church how to use these materials. You need to ask your preacher, and I don't think you have to ask him very, very, uh, uh, I, I think just an instant, he'll say yes. Say, train us how to use back to the Bible. Let's put it in your hands. Let's put that PowerPoint on the screen, and let's lay it into the hands of every member, and let's let you fill it out line by line, and let's let you open the Bible, underline the passage, circle the answer, and let's deal with some of the, the words that might scare you, like maybe sanctification, and give a simple answer. And let's train our members how to use Believe the Bible, Does It Matter, the bookmarks, and, the, and all the various tools. Let's make sure that when we put a tool into the hands of church members, they know how to use it. You know, a Dewalt drill or a into the hands of a carpenter is a, is a beautiful, beautiful piece of machinery, isn't it? In the hands of a preacher, it's a deadly weapon. All right, It just depends on who's handling it. And so we want to make sure people know what they're doing, right? We, if you're going to get per, uh, you don't go to work. No, you, don't, you don't hire someone at work and say, well, there's a forklift, good luck. 
You get forklift training. You might even have to have a certificate to drive the thing. You know, you, you, you're even a dolly. I mean, that could be deadly. You're going you're to teach them how to use the dolly, you know, the cart, and how to get, whatever it is. Brethren, when you guys go to work, you get training. Because if you don't get that training, right, you're going you're gonna to be expensive to the, the company. Why don't we train our church members? Let's train them how to use the tools. And so we need to spend extensive amounts of time. And I'm not talking about Monday night for the masters. Guess how many of you are going to show up Monday night for training? No disrespect intended, but brother, you've got some farming to do. And I mean, you just got to raise your family, you know. And I understand that. You've you got jobs to do. And you, you, you can't come every Monday. I get that. I'm, listen, I'm, I'm with you. When should you do this training? Sunday morning. Why don't we do it Sunday morning? Why don't we do it when everybody sits in the pews? Why don't we do it during the sermon? And why don't we preach and train at the same time? Because you won't lose anybody. You won't have to worry about your Bible class teachers losing out. You don't have to worry about losing the Sunday morning crowd. You don't have to worry about uh, interference. In fact, what we're finding, this, this is exciting. When you train your church members on Sunday morning during the sermon, if you spend that time and preach through this material and then put it in the hand, I mean, they're holding it in their hands and they're filling it. you got 12-year-olds out there and 15-year-olds out there and 18-year-olds out there filling out this material. Guess what might happen when you're finished with book three? You wouldn't be surprised if one of them came forward, would you? Would you be surprised if there was maybe someone out there in the auditorium that walked forward? Because they do it almost every single week. A church will say, Rob, you'll never guess what just happened. Rob, I, I didn't even do a Bible. One preacher did. Well, ask McKinley Pate at Shiloh. Ask McKinley Pate what happened. He said, Rob, I, was, I just finished book three. He said, I called for the invitation. This man walks forward. He said, Rob, he's been visiting. I Rob, um, I didn't do a Bible study with him, but I baptized him. I said, yes, you did. I said, you did a Bible study every Sunday morning as he filled that book out. I said, what might happen is we might have conversion. You might have some of your own young people who realize for the, in the first, I'm lost and I need to be baptized. Not only does this training train the saved, it teaches the lost. Train them. Let's go to the next one. These are simple. I'm this, and I, I, what I'm doing, let me explain what I'm doing right now. How many of you ever play, anybody ever in the room ever play a sport? Anybody ever play? Okay, all right. So um, if you play a ball, any, any kind of ball, more than likely at some point the coach either took you into a locker room, gathered you into a circle, brought out a chalkboard or a whiteboard, and he put, what's he put on it? X's and O's, right? This is X's and O's. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm putting the X's and O's on there. Now those X's and O's don't mean a thing until the whistle blows. Because I coached, I coached high school ball. I've coached uh, at various, uh, various states. I've coached it. And it's amazing. The whistle blows, and you look at your team. They're doing nothing they were told to do in the locker room. I mean, they do nothing. That, I said, where did that come from? This is X's and O's. I've got to give you the X's and O's. Then we're going to blow the whistle. Then we've got to operate it. But before we go into operation, I've got to kind of show you what those X's and O's look like. This is the application of the seminar. So it's not good enough that you just attended a seminar and said, well, that was exciting. It's not good enough. It, you won't produce results. I, I, what, you ought to want, what you ought to demand is results. I want to see a difference. I want to see souls saved. So that, this is why we're laying it out like this. Systematically, step by step, we're putting X's and O's on the board and we're placing them on there and then we're going to blow the whistle we got to train our church members. Number four, we have got to create an evangelistic atmosphere in our church. As exciting as evangelism can be to a church, it's got to be a culture. Evangelism has to be a culture that permeates through the church. It's got to be, it's got to be part of your left and right hand. I'm going to say that this is one of the most difficult things to accomplish... It's going to take time and patience. It takes 21 habits, uh, days to break a habit. It takes a year to change a culture. You're going to have to be very persistent about this. Everything you do has got to be looked through from the prism of evangelism. So, so when you have a vacation Bible school, you look through it from the prison of saving souls. When you, have a, when you have a benevolent need, you look through the prism of saving souls. When you have a Bible camp, it's through the prism of saving souls. When, when, when you have a graduation banquet, it's through the prism of saving souls. May I suggest this? Whether it be evangelism, edification, or benevolence, 
If the purpose isn't saving souls, you ought to shut it down. Am I, off a, am, I, am I too far off the limb? Is it not the mission of Christ, Luke 19 and verse 10, to come and seek and save the lost? Is that not his mission? Brethren, is that not his purpose? Can you imagine? Can you imagine Jesus coming into some of our churches and saying, why are you doing this? If it's not for the purpose of reaching the lost, and yes, edifying the brethren so they can reach the lost is a work of the church. That's what we're doing tonight. I'm going to give you an example of what this looks like. I'm, going to put, I'm just going to put one of the X's on the board. I got a lot of them, but just one. Let's suppose we decided in this church that we're going to take a benevolence, which is normally the albatross around the neck, which is to, to some preachers, it was at least to this preacher, an inconvenience. It got in my way. I, I got to a point where I was just tired of benevolence. seems like every time I walked in the office, the phone rang, and I had to go through the, through, through, through the, through the scenario of trying to figure out if they're authentic or not, if they're trying to take advantage of me or not, and should, I help, should we help them, should we not? So let's just suppose we did this. Hello? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, my, my name's Brother Hall. I'm the preacher here. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, we do help people here. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we pay, we pay gas bills. Yes. Yes, we, we help with car payments. Yes, we help with food. Yes, we help with... Yes, oh, yes, I know your car's broken down. Probably in my parking lot. You're, I'm, I'm sure you're coming from New York, and uh, you're a member of the church, aren't you? I mean, I, we, this is the calls. We get constant... Don't we get calls just like this? Have you ever noticed they're always coming from New York, they always break down in your parking lot, and they're always a member of the Church of Christ, and when you ask them where they attend, oh, don't you know Reverend Smith? You know, they're lying to you. <laughs> now, what if you did this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we help people. Now, when do you help people? We help people every Sunday morning at 9.30, and we can't wait to see you. Well, what do you mean at 9.30? I, I, yes, I need help right now. I'm sorry, sir. We offer that help 9.30 Sunday morning. We just can't wait to see you. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know if I can get there Sunday morning at 9.30. I don't have a car. Don't worry. We'll send somebody for you. Well, I don't know if I can make it at 9.30. That's okay. We do it again at 5 o'clock on Sunday evenings, and we can't wait to see you. Well, I don't know if I can make it on Sunday. You know, it's a tough day for me. No problem. We do it 7 o'clock Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and we can't wait to see you. And when they walk into your church building, do you know what should happen? Brethren, one of the members of this church, one of the men who are trained to do this, identifies who that is. You take them to room two, room three, or room four. You sit down and guess what you do? A Bible study. If we can't do a Bible study during Bible class, we're in serious trouble. So let's sit down, take back to the Bible, and let's do a Bible study with all those who are requesting benevolent help and see what happens. That idea came to me from the Crossville Church of Christ, and it's incredible what they do there. Somebody calls and says, we need help. Sure, we'll be glad to help you. You just got to come Sunday morning, 9.30. Can't wait to see you. Wednesday night, 7. Believe you me, if they're really needing help, they'll be there. And when you're done with that Bible study, introduce them to your deacon or your elder or whoever it is who runs your benevolent um, um, mission and help them to whatever degree you believe is fair. But I don't know about you. I'd be much more willing to help somebody that actually did a Bible study than to help some charlatan out here I'm never going to see again. Why don't we make benevolence evangelistically centered? When benevolence becomes evangelistically centered, guess what you start getting? You start taking things like winter coat drives and backpack drives and teacher supplies and turkey giveaways and blessing boxes and vouchers and benevolent buildings and you start turning them into soul-saving works. Like Miss Kim. Hello? Yes. Uh, and your name is Kim? Yes, my name's Deb Rice. I'm the secretary here. Yes, yes. Um, I just moved into the community. I got this house to house, heart to heart, and uh, uh, it says that you guys have a free community services. Yeah, yes, we do. Um, she says, I really need some help, and uh, I don't have a lot of money for food, and I just moved here. I don't have anything. Well, yes, ma'am, we'd be glad to help you. Oh, that's wonderful. When can you help me? Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. Oh. Well, I don't have a car. Don't worry. We're going to come get you. Oh, that's awful nice of you. And someone did. And we went, went and picked Miss Kim up and took her to church, and she's getting to know people. And it's a lovely church, not a really nice preacher. That Alan Webster is really nice, you know. And, and um, I said, well, Kim, I said, you said you needed some help. What do you need? Well, I need, to, I need a little food. I said, no problem. We'll stop by at the grocery store on the way home and get you a little food, you know. So we stopped by the grocery store, got her a little food, you know. Hey, preacher, she's uh, so used to be calling pre. I'm just a member now. Hey, hey Rob, um, um, 
I need a I need something to keep me from falling in the shower. I keep falling. I got a bad back. I, shower mat. Yeah, aisle two. Let's go get one. We got her the shower mat. I said, we'll even help it get in the shower for you. Can I walked in. We walked in her, her apartment. Mold is everywhere. I said, Kim, have you been sick since you moved here? Yes, I have. I'm always sick. She said, Ever? She said what do you think it is? I said, you have black mold all through this apartment. I said, uh, who you rent this from? Oh, the housing authority. I said, I think we can fix this. <laughs> so we called the housing authority. And the very next week, they had a brand new place waiting for her. And um, it takes a little persuasion, you know. And uh, so, so uh, Kim says, well, Rob, that's nice of y'all. But how am I going to move? She said, my family took off. My, my daughter doesn't hardly talk to me. I can't move all this furniture. I said, no problem. How many of you men would help move furniture if we needed your help to get a Bible study. I bet all of us would. We showed up. Uh, we, we all showed up with our trucks and trailers. We loaded it on up, moved her into the next apartment or got, got brand new place. You know, she said, this is the nicest place I've ever lived, Rob. And, and we set our bed up and, you know, got our mat in there, you know, and we're just sitting there talking. Hey, Kim, man, you, you, all these cards. What do you want me to do with all these cards you've been getting? Yeah, that church of yours, Rob. Man, I got like 50 cards from that church. This is a nice. I said, Kim, I've got a question for you. What do you think about the, I don't know, Jacksonville Church of Christ? She said, well, I like it. It's a great church. I, I said, Kim, would you like to know more about us? She says, I sure would. <laughs> I just so happened to have these little booklets. I said, can we sit down and can we open our Bibles? She said, well, that would be just fine. What do you think she did when we stu finished that study? Brother, she's faithful. I mean, Kim's going to be there. This is the kind of... Uh, this, is, this is the kind of atmosphere we got to create in the church. When we look at we, everything we do, whether it be someone coming in the building to resupply our paper products, thank God for that sister. He, he told me that right here in this church today. And I, I can't wait for you to, you need to tell the church about that Sunday morning. With that sister, she, that man asked him, there's a contact, right? Everything we do becomes about reaching souls, including benevolence. Let's go to the next one, number five. Now, I'm just, I'm just putting a few X's out there. Boy, we've got a, we got a lot of stuff to give you. Number five, we've got to produce contacts. Now, brethren, if I, had, um, if I had one thing I was allowed to say tonight, I'd start right here. If you don't have any contacts, you've got nothing in the church. You can have the finest church building, you've got a great one. You could, you, could have the, you could have the nicest uh, classrooms, the most modern technology. You could have the greatest sound system, the padded pews, the carpet. You could have every, the biggest bank account in the world. But if you don't have contacts, you don't have anything. The church is a church, it's a people church. It's a church of people, meaning we need people. Without people, we, we don't go anywhere. Now, let's, let's take that to the next level. Take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. I want to show you something. And I wish I knew this even a year ago. I wish I saw this. I'm, I'm so thankful here. Um, I'm so thankful to be here tonight and to have an opportunity to share some of these things with you. And um, I tell you what, I think it's Matthew chapter I said 19. Now, I may have made a mistake here. It's so new that sometimes I even trick myself. Now, um, let's see here. Matthew 22. Oh, there it is. 22. Matthew 22. Let's just read a little bit. And let's just uh, make this very practical. I'm going to hit some verses. You might want to have a pen ready. And uh, Brother Caleb, this will preach. Make a sermon out of this for me. Verse 3, and he sent forth his servants to call. I want you to take that word call. I want you to look at it. Brother, we serve a calling God. A God that calls people. We, we can't sit back and wait for them to call us. They're not coming. We have a God that says call them. We've got to get out there and call people. If we don't get out there and call people, we're not going to be able to make contact. So it's a calling gospel. He called them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. And so sometimes you get out there and you call, but they still won't come. And, and, uh, and so he gets out there, and the king heard of this in verse 7. He was angry, and, and, um, and the Bible says he, he sent out his, uh, his, his servants, verse number 9, into the highways, and, and he said, and many... And many as you find, bid him to the marriage. I want you to take that word many, and I want you to focus on it. Because, because that word is a key word in evangelism. Now let's keep going down. Go down to verse number nine. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them. He's a bidding God, a calling God. Verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways, gathered together as many. 
Focus on that word again. As they found both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests, and when the king came to see the guests, he saw the man which had not a wedding garment. Now let's go down, let's just go down to verse number 14. For many are called, and few are chosen. Now I'm going to rewrite that verse to reflect what I'm seeing in churches of Christ today. You ready? For few are called, and almost no one's chosen. Do you know who understands Matthew 22 and verse 14 with perfect clarity? Do you know out here in the secular world, do you know who understands Matthew 22, 14? Walmart. Hallmark. Salesmen. Recruiters. I tell you, every, anyone out there who's trying to... I, I guarantee that Navy recruiter, he under, where's the Navy recruiter going to set up his shop? Probably a mall. Why? He needs many. Brethren, if you don't call many, you're not going to get few. So I'm going to be realistic with you this evening. I had a church call me a few weeks ago. Rob, we're struggling. I said, what is it? He said, man, it's just not working like we hoped it would. And I said, well, brother, I said, let me start with number one. How many contacts you got? He said, I said, well, number one, you got a contact list? He said, I do. I said, how many people on your contact list? He said, two. He called two. So if you call two, how many you get? Not, almost nothing. So it's volume, isn't it? So Walmart understands you need many. He need, they need many customers. If they don't have many customers... I was at a, a church at Painesville, Kentucky. He's an elder, owned a Hallmark store. And I, 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 well, I, I tell you what, I couldn't wait to get in that meeting with those elders. And I sat down. This man owns two Hallmark stores. I think there's two of them. Uh, brother, how was, how, how, how was business today at Hallmark? He said, man, it was good. I said, what does that mean? I said, he said, man, we had the customers. I said, how many, how many customers does it take to have good days? He said, oh, about 50. He knew his metric, didn't he? So you got that army recruiter. Does he have metrics he has to meet? You better believe it. How about that fundraiser out there? You know, how, how about that fundraiser? I, I, one, of our, one of our fundraisers for our, our Christian universities came up to me recently. We were talking. I said, oh, brother, I said, would you mind answering a question for me? I won't identify who you are or what school you're with. I just need a question. I said, how many contacts you got in that phone to raise those funds? He said, about 1,000. I said, so it takes many contacts? He said, it takes many. I said, so you just can't have 10? He said, can't have 10. How many contacts do you need in this church in order for us to have a few? Brethren, you're going to have to have a lot of contacts. That's what I'm trying to say. I'll tell you what, our farmers understand that. That's why they farm 3,000 acres. You won't make it with 30. And you won't make it with 300. And so our farmers understand if I'm going to feed my family, I've got to have X amount of crop or I'm not going to make it. And so they under, so whatever, wherever you're at tonight, you, you understand those numbers are important in the church of Christ why is it that we don't make the same application? Because Jesus said in Matthew 22, he said, many are called. Now, let's take that even further, Caleb. Why don't you throw in there Matthew 7, 13 and 14? Narrow is the way that leads to life to you, there be that find it. So let, let's just be honest tonight. And, 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 and I don't want to paint a picture that I can't, I can't, uh, I can't uh, make real. So are you going to go out here and baptize 100 people? Well, you could but you're probably going to have to reach hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of people to do it. I mean, you're going to have to get... You got to have, so you're, it's proportional. You're going to have to get out there and get a lot of contacts. What I'm trying to suggest tonight is that this right here is where the butter's made. And if we don't get this right, nothing else matters. We've got to call a lot of people. Now, how do you call people? Well, I'm going to share with your elders and preacher tonight um, some, exciting, uh, some exciting tools that will call lots of people. And I'm going to share with you guys some as well. Contacts in the evangelism model is step one. It's this first step you got to take. You've got to have contact. Now, there are some things you can do to produce them. Let me share with you just a few. If you properly use house to house, heart to heart, it will give you contacts. But most churches don't use it properly. And um, one of the reasons um, uh, that uh, Alan Webster contacted me years ago it was because we were having conversions using house to house, heart to heart, and he wanted to know how we were doing it. He said, tell me, how, how do you, tell me, what, what is it, what, what is it, what approach are you using? Because we have churches out there that send it out for years and they get no conversions. And we want to know what the difference is. And so one of the things I started to realize as I'm going to these churches, that most of our churches, yes, they love, way, they love the concept, they love the way it looks, but they don't know how to use it. 
So we've got to train our churches how to use tools because that's a contact creator. Now think about it. What does house to house do for this church? It makes sure that your community knows you're here. It places it in their mailbox. But there are some things that are important about this publication, and if we don't set it up right, it won't work. For example, I'm going to give you just one right now. Let's suppose the house to house publication showed up in my mailbox and I just got home from work, Caleb. I've had a hard day. My marriage is on the rocks. And I'm searching for answers and I'm not finding them. And I walked out to my mailbox and I saw that house. I said, that, that church is always sending that to me. And I sat in my easy chair for just a minute, silence around the house. I said, you know what? I've got to change something in my life and maybe church is where I need to start. And I'm going to call it. And so you got out your house to house to heart that says Fayette Church of Christ and about six, six o'clock that evening you called it. What are you going to get? What's going to happen when you call that phone number? Well, let me tell you what happens in a lot of our churches. The phone's either disconnected or no one's there. So how many times are they going to call that before they give up? How many opportunities are we going to have? So one of the first, one, one, just, I'm just making one suggestion. One suggestion is we put a phone number on that that gives me a human being. That, that we actually put the preacher's phone number or an elder's phone number on that. that, that or the, the, the phone number gets to me so when someone calls and says, listen, I need some help. I don't care what time it is. I'm available. What happens if you had a business? Let's say you had a lawn care business and your phone number was all over the place and every time people called the number, they couldn't get anybody. And so there are things that we can do with this that make it very effective. Now, again, I've got 10 things that make this effective. And when it's effective, let me tell you what it produces. There it is. Now, brethren, that was just a year and a half ago. So all, all the examples I'm going to give you in this seminar have happened in the last two years. This is Jacksonville. And um, I just got home from a seminar. And my wife said, I'd like to go see my mom. I said, honey, go right ahead. So she went up to Nashville. And I'm down at Jacksonville. She's got the kids. And I... I um, um, I, I sat in the pew Sunday morning. I looked to my left, and there's this lady. And um, she's, uh, she's sitting, she, her, her name is Ellen. She's sitting on the left-hand corner side, fan-shaped auditorium. Alan finishes his sermon. He walks down the aisle. I follow him. And uh, he said, Alan, who is that? He said, Rob, she's visiting this morning. Perfect. So I've moved in behind her, and uh, I, I'm not going to let her escape. And so I'm sitting right behind her, closing prayer. She turns around, and there I am. Hey, my name's Rob. Uh, you visiting this morning? Yeah. My name's Ellen. Well, Ellen, nice, nice to meet you. Are you visiting from the community? She says, sure am. I said, wonderful, Ellen. And uh, I, said, uh, I said, Ellen, did you enjoy the service this morning? I did. I said, what'd you like about it? Well, man, that preacher out there, he loves the Bible. I said, yeah, we love the Bible. And uh, I said, Ellen, you by yourself? No, well, my husband was coming, got sick. I had to take him home. But, uh, but uh, I would like to meet your husband. What's his name? His name's Perry. I said, well, I'd like to meet Perry. And, uh, and she says, well, you know what? She says, I'd like to come back and hear him preach again. Do y'all have an evening service? I said, we just so happen to have one at 6 o'clock. And he said, well, wonderful. I'll, I'll, uh, she said, I'll come back at 6 o'clock. I said, well, my wife will be here tonight. I said, you'll get to meet her. So I called my wife. I said, honey, I need you to come home. She said, we had a visitor, didn't we? I said, we did. <laughs> so she comes home. Nicole drives home Sunday morning after worship. And we get in Sunday evening. And here's, here's uh, Ellen and Perry. They sit down. And I introduce my wife. Hey, Ellen, this is my wife, uh, Nicole. And this is uh, my husband, Perry. Perry, nice to meet you. We're just talking, you know. And Hey, Ellen and Perry, we just so happen to have this custom. We always invite visitors out to eat. Would you guys? I said, Perry, what's your favorite restaurant in Jacksonville? Just, what is it? Well, it's a fingers, Rob. And I Oh, so boy, you got good taste, Perry. That's good food, you know. He said, yeah. I said, Perry, could we, could we take you as our guest to Athena's? Uh, Rob? He said, what? It's a little. He said, yeah, but I, he said, I said, well, let's go tonight. He said, well, man, he said, if I'm going to Athena's, I want to eat, Rob. And uh, he said, I don't feel too good. He said, can I take a rain check for next Sunday? We'll come for Athena's. Oh, yeah, they're coming. And I said, yes. I said, take, yes, your rain check. And so we get, I called, made reservations, and, and uh, they came back the next Sunday. We, we drive over to Athena's. We sit around the table, Jared, Hannah, Nicole, and I, Perry and Ellen. We're sitting there talking. I have one mission. Now watch this. This is not hard. You can do this. Everyone in the auditorium can do this. Perry, um, hey, uh, what do you like to do? What, what, what interest do you have? Oh, oh well, uh, yeah, I was a pest control guy for years, Rob. And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, what I really like is sports. 
I said, yeah, I do too. I do too. Perry, well, was it NFL football? Is that what you like? He said, not anymore. Disrespectful players. I said, I agree. Disrespectful. And I said, what else, Perry? I like baseball? He said, well, that's all. a little slow, though. I said, all right. I said, uh, Perry, well, what do you like? You know, he said, he said, Rob. He said, you know what? He said, go Alabama. Oh, no. Go Alabama. I said, if I've got to root for Alabama football to get a Bible study, brothers, that's exactly what I'll root for. I don't care what team it is. Now, I'm a, I'm a Kentucky fan, a Tennessee fan. That's where my children are born. But if I've got to root for Alabama to get a Bible study, I'll say, go Nick Saban. You know, I said, well, man, Nick Saban was a good coach, you know. And I said, yeah, boy, he is, Perry. I said, man, alive. I, Perry, I said, it's been a tough year for you. He said, yeah. This is the year at Clemson, you know, made it, and Alabama didn't. And um, I said, and I said, uh, you know, uh, no, excuse me, it's LSU and Clemson that year. And I said, Perry, I said, um, you know what? I said, you still want to watch the game, don't you? He said, yeah. I said, you know what we're having at my house tomorrow? He said, what? We're having a football party. Ouch, what was that? That was my wife kicking me under the table because we weren't. And, um, and I said, we're having a football party tomorrow. And I said, you're invited to come. My wife is going to make sausage balls and those pigs in the blanket, is that what you call them? And we're going to get the mustard and the dips and the chips. And Honey, can we go to their house? I thought I was in fifth grade. Can we go to their house tomorrow and watch the football game? She said, well, sure, why not? They show up at my house. My wife and I helped because I helped. I had to help this time. We got it all together. And we're watching football, LSU creamed them. You remember that, right? I mean, it was a blowout. Halftime. Game's pretty much over. I looked over at Perry. I have one mission, by the way. Hey, Perry, uh, you know there's a dozen churches in Jacksonville. I'm just curious. Well, what do you want, Rob? I said, I want to know why you chose Jacksonville. Well, 21 years ago, y'all started sending us this publication called House to House, Heart to Heart. Now, Rob, I read it every time it comes out. Now, don't always agree with it, but, man, y'all love the Bible. It's always about the Bible. And I said, yes, I said, that, that's what it is. I said, Perry, I said, what, what do you know about the Church of Christ? Oh, I don't know, not a whole lot. I said, would you like to know more? He said, well, I kind of would. I said, I just so happen to have these little booklets. What do you think happened three weeks later? On the back side, you've got to advertise. You've got to promote. A business doesn't make it if it doesn't promote. Why would I want to come here? So what's going to draw people? What's going to draw them in here? we got Dan Winkler coming. That's not drawing the community. They don't care. we got Rob Whitaker. They don't care. Well, you know, what, what, will, what will make the community come? You've got to figure that out. You've got to put things on the back of that to say come. Like maybe, let me give you a couple. Like a trunk or treat. I tell you, if y'all lined up your cars and decorated them and advertised to the community that you're going to give out free candy and tractor and hayride, can you tractor and hayride? And you're going to do, you think people will come to this church building? Oh, they're come. How about if you advertise, uh, how about if you advertise uh, maybe Saturday night, uh, Saturday evening, come out here to the church building, we're going to serve homemade ice cream to the community. You think anybody come for homemade ice cream? How about fish fry, catfish fry, homemade ice cream? You think people will come? They're not coming for hot dogs. You've got to come up with something that brings people to the building. All right? So maybe it's a, maybe it's a marriage uh, enrichment weekend where you work on your marriage. Or maybe it's a parenting something, but you've got to get them here. So you've got to promote things that help bring contact. Special offers are inside that that say, hey, fill this out. We'll send you a free uh, a, a poster of the Ten Commandments. Hello? Yes, Deb? Rob, we just had somebody. Her name's Brenda. Yes. And Brenda called Rob, and she said that... Uh, uh, she sent us this little request from house to house, and she says she wants the free marriage material that we advertise. Yes. Uh, Rob, should I mail it to her like we always do? I said, no. Well, the elder said I was supposed to call you before I do anything with this house to house. What, what am I supposed to do with it, Rob? I said, put it in my box. But, Rob, we're supposed to mail it. I said, we're not. I said, just put it in my box. I, I drove up to the to the church office. I got it out of my box. Nicole's with me. I never go alone. You never knock on the door. Men, you always take your wife or a young person or somebody else. Do not go alone for multiple reasons. So I, I go up to the door. I, she opens. Her name is Brenda. Hello? Uh, uh, yes, my name is Rob. This is my wife, Nicole. Yes, yes. I said, we're, we're from the community. You asked for some marriage material from house to house, heart to heart. Oh, yes. I said, well, I've come to deliver it for you. Well, that was really nice. I said, now this is a book right here. It's written by so-and-so. And this little DVD right. Oh, yeah. That was really, really, I, I was really, sir, sir, wait a minute. 
Why did you not just mail it to me? Well, I couldn't have met you, Brenda. I wanted to meet you. Oh, that's really nice. Brenda, did you just move here? Yes, yes. Where'd you move? Oxford. I said, okay. Brenda, how long have you been here? About a month. And uh, Brenda, now, I, I assume you're married. Just got married about a month ago. I said, well, congratulations. Sir, wait, 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 sir, sir, just a minute. Sir, can I ask you another question? I said, yes. She said, do you know anything about the Bible? Oh, just a little bit. I said, just a little. She said, good, because my husband knows nothing about the Bible. Daniel, get in here, Daniel. Daniel, get up out of the couch. That man's been on the couch ever since he came home. I don't know what he does all day. Daniel, get out the couch and get over here. There are people here to see you. Daniel gets up, cleans his eyes up, walks over to the door. He's about half asleep. Brenda says, Daniel, this is Robin Nicole, and we're going to teach you the Bible. This man knows nothing about the Bible. Brother, you could have blown me over. I said, when do you want to start? She said, what about tomorrow? I said, my wife will bring chocolate chip cookies. Always eat. Always bring food. From that one knock on the door, we baptized and we baptized and we baptized cousins, friends, neighbors, family, and we just kept baptizing. What would have happened if I mailed it? You want to take a guess? Nothing. That's how you use house to house properly. You gotta have a target list. And so every visitor that walks in your doors that's in this community, they get put on the list. Every person you work with gets put on the list. Every family member that lives in this area gets put on the list. You need a target list. And that target list is populated in a spreadsheet by a secretary or a preacher. You send it to us and we add them to the mailing area so we make sure everyone that's known by someone in this church is getting that. Now, let's talk about door knocking. Let me, let me, let me lay out a scenario. And, and this pretty much explains why we don't door knock. Here it is. Yes, yes. My name's Rob, my wife, Nicole. We've got a gospel meeting coming up. Uh, and uh, we've got Brother Joe Smith preaching. And uh, he's well known. And uh, we'd like you to come to our, our meeting on Sunday. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, nice to meet you, sir. So you're going to do that for four hours on Saturday. Your women are going to cook a meal. And they're going to pour out the sweat. How many people are going to come? You're going to work. How many people are coming? Almost nobody. So the next time we do our door knocking, Caleb, guess how many people show up to knock doors? Very few. Well, don't work, preacher. We're, I mean, you know, I got other things to be doing. So, so understandably, we're result-oriented, and we don't want to waste time. So what we've done in our school is we've explored different options for effective door knocking. We've come up with three, and these three will give you a 30% success rate. The first thing we did was we moved the goalpost. The goalpost of inviting someone to church or starting a Bible study at the door is almost impossible to reach. No one in this audience has an arm like John Elway, and so we're not going to reach the, the end zone like that. And so if that's what you're expecting to accomplish, when you knock on the door, you, will fail. you are setting yourself up for failure. Don't do that. Here's what, what is the purpose of knocking doors? Is it to convert? No. Is it to get them to church? No. Is it to set up a Bible study? No. But that's what we've done historically. I've done that for 20 years. What if the purpose of the knock on the door was this? Now watch this. Um, sir, my name's Rob. My wife, Nicole, we're Christians in your area. And uh, we're, uh, it's been a tough year. And uh, we're asking our community... Uh, to, to let us know if there's somebody that needs prayers. And we're, we're, we'd like to pray this morning with you. Do you have a family member? Uh, maybe somebody you know? Well, sir, my mother back there just moved in last week, and she's got a dementia. And uh, would you mind praying for her? Yes, ma'am, I'd be glad to do it. I said, do you mind if I get her name? Yes, ma'am. Tammy, what's your name? My name is Sue. As soon as I write down their information, guess what I just created? A contact. That's called success, and I will be back. I can give you three ways to do that. I got training material in all three ways. I will give you a 30% success rate in all three ways. This is called new movers. Anybody here in the audience own a business? Manage? Okay. What kind of business, sir? Do you mind me asking? Oil field business. Sir, what kind of business? Did you... Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Any, 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 anything at all? I'm trying to think if this will work with an oil field business and... Uh, it, it might work. And let's just make you a dentist tonight, okay? <laughs> we're we're going to be a dentist. All right. Let's just suppose this man's a dentist. And uh, he moves into the community. He rents out a little shop over here, sets his equipment up. And, um, and I come by. I'm a salesman. Uh, 
Uh, what's your name, sir? Eddie. Hey, hey, Eddie. My name's Rob. Hey, hey Eddie. Uh, I, I offer a service. I thought you might be interested in it. I can give you the name and address of every person who moves into this community. Uh, would you be interested in that, Eddie? Why? Contacts. And, and, I, and in your business, you have contacts. You've you got to have them or you go out of business. So, so that, that dentist wants to know who's moving. What? Is the person moving in to the community more valuable than Caleb, who's lived here for 10 years? Now well, think about it. Now think about that question. Could be. Why, why would that person that just moved here be a more valuable contact to that dentist than the person who's been? Is it more than likely the person that's been here for 10 years already has a dentist? But that person who just moved here, is it, do you think they've got one yet? Would you like to be the first dentist that they meet? In fact, if, if you're a good dentist, this is what I'd do. I'd send them a little promotional flyer and said, first uh, teeth screening free. Welcome to the community. Bring this little coupon. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it, but I'd figure out some way because that new... What if, I, what if we had access to every new person who moved into your area and we could give it to you? And we could give you their name and address. And we could say, even bring up a little app that showed you exactly where they live. And we could say, they live by that elder. They live by that preacher. They live by you. They just live down the street. And in fact, here's what David Shannon said about that. He said, people are most likely to change churches when they move. A couple of generations ago, if a couple or a family or an individual moved from one city to another city, they usually stayed with that same denomination. He said, those days are over. He says... It doesn't matter to me what denomination they were in in the last town. Your average person today is willing to look at any church in their neighborhood. That is a powerful opportunity for evangelism. It doesn't matter to me what church they were in in the last town. I want them to visit a church of Christ because it's going to give us the best opportunity one day to sit down and study the word of God. Brethren, you've got to go after every person who moves into this community and we will give you their name and address. You think that's worth something? That's gold. You go, you, you, have you guys ever noticed that when you move, anybody in this, anybody ever moved before? What, Caleb, I know you've moved, you're a preacher, okay. Caleb, when you move, what's the first piece of literature that pops into your mailbox? Who's it from? Lowe's. Lowe's always finds you. And they always have 10% off. And, and, and Home Depot will have 15% off if you just wait to the next day. They always know when you move. Why? Why do they send you that coupon? Because when you move, they know you need paint. They know you need nails. They know you need wallpaper and carpet and lumber and whatever. Else. They always know when you move. They're smart, aren't they? Brethren, it's time we get smart. When people move into this community, guess who's going to be the first church that knocks on their door? Fayette Church of Christ. You're going to be the first church that shows up on their door. Right now, my wife, is, uh, my wife is doing something for your ladies. Now, gentlemen, hold on now. My wife is teaching your ladies how to do something very important. My wife is teaching your ladies how to go shopping in the name of the Lord. And she says, I want you to go to your Dollar Tree. And my wife went to Dollar Tree when she got here Sunday afternoon. And I said, Caleb, I got some things I got to do. Remember that? I can't get to your... My wife had to go shopping. Now, this is God-ordained shopping. She's going to go into that Dollar Tree. She's going to pick out 10 items and a basket. It's going to cost about $10. And we're going to get that basket. It's called the new mover basket. So not only at house to house, heart to heart, are we going to send them a new movers edition and a postcard. One of your members and their wife, couple, are going to knock on their door and say, Welcome to Fayette, Alabama. And here is a basket prepared by our members. Welcome to the community. And inside it, you'll also find some cards. Uh, we've got a couple members here to do some handy work. I thought it might be interested. One of our men mows lawns. And, uh, and uh, by the way, uh, we have a contact sheet for you. That's uh, who you call for internet. That's who you call for utilities. Man, that's information needed. And, uh, and we just want to welcome you to the... And by the way, my wife made you a fresh batch of chocolate chip cookies. Guess what kind of reception you're going to get? Pretty good. Oh, by the way, if y'all don't have a church home... Our contact information. Oh, that's really not. Well, what church is it? Uh, just the Church of Christ down the road here, Fayette, Fayette Church. Oh, well, that's really nice. Guess what that's called right there? Contact. And by the way, I know how many people move into your city every month. I'll tell you here in just a minute. I know exactly how many. Let's go to the next one. What about cards? This is this right here is a. <laughs> this is the. If there was a silver bullet, this is it. 
People love handwritten cards. And so let's start taking those contacts and let's start flooding them with cards. In fact, let's ask the members, do you know somebody that's had surgery in the community? Do you know someone who's lost a loved one? Give me their name, give me their address, and we're not going to send one card with 50 signatures. We're going to send 30 cards to them this week. Now, we're not going to all send them Monday. This is very strategic. We're going to send five Sunday, five, or five Monday, five Tuesday, five Wednesday, five Thursday, five Friday. They're going to be covered up with cards. They're going to get more cards than they've ever received in their lifetime. Brethren, this right here will open the heart like nothing else we've seen. This right here produces every single week. And guess what? It will involve every member of this church. No one's exempt. No sign-up lists. The elders just have to create groups. I would suggest at least four. Week one, week two, week three, week four. And you gather them in a room. You get all the cards and you're going to fill cards out. Give them to your secretary. She fills out the spreadsheet. She mails them strategically. What happens when you do that? You get patina. That's what happens. I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but we walked into her, her place and I said... Uh, Bettina and I were just talking, and I, it's time to make my move. <laughs> Bettina, I said, you got cards everywhere in this house. Oh, yeah, right, that's that Jacksonville Church of Christ you go to. Yes, ma'am. She said, I like that church. I said, you do? She said, Rob, look at all these cards. I haven't got any, I've not gotten this many cards almost my whole life. They're everywhere. Cards are just everywhere. And, and I said, well, Bettina, I said, well, what do you think about that Jacksonville Church? She said, well, I really like it. I said, Bettina, would you like to know more? I'm kind of robotic, aren't I? Have y'all noticed that? I kind of say the same thing over and over again. And that's all you got to do. What do you think about the Fayette Church? Oh, I like it. They send lots of cards. Would you like to know more about it? Oh, I sure would. I just so happen to have these little booklets. You see the booklet, don't you? That's book one. You see she's holding the card? She couldn't be happier. She has nobody except the church. I gotta tell you what happened. We're in study number three. You guys gotta hear this. We're in study number three. We're going, that's the red booklet, right? We're in the red booklet. We're going through it. And as we go through the red booklet, we get to Mark 16, 16. And I normally read Mark 16, 16. And, and, uh, but this time, for some reason, I wanted her to do it. And I said, well, Tina, I said, uh, why don't you read that next verse, Mark 16, 16? She says, okay. Now, she said, all right. Oh, Rob. She said, I, I know this verse. I said, oh, good. I said, my pastor has told me all about it. I bet he has. <laughs> I'm wondering what she's going to say, right? Yeah, he that believes is saved and then they're baptized. Uh, Bettina, would you read that verse again? Oh, sure, Rob. He that believes is saved and then baptized. That's a King James. Uh, Bettina, Rob, is there something wrong with what I'm doing? I said, well, I don't know yet. I said, could you read that like one word at a time? Like, don't read it all together. Just like one word at a time. Oh, yes. Now, let me get down there with my glass. He that believes and is baptized shall... He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Rob, that is not what my pastor told me that verse said. I bet not. What do you think she did? Hey, Alan... Will you help me? we got to baptize somebody. You know what? She needed a Bible study. She'd never done one in her life. She, had no, she only knew what the pastor told her. Most people have never read their Bible. Don't tell them what to do because they'll argue with you. Let them read it. It's hard to argue with God. Let them read it. That's why a Bible study is important. After she dried off, I, I had time to talk to Bettina. I said, Bettina, I said... I just had a suspicion that you were associated with the Church of Christ sometime during your life. Oh, well, Rob, I better... Rob, now I was a Baptist. Not anymore. I said, well, we're glad. Um, she said, now, Rob, when I... The last town I was in was Ohatchee. That's in Alabama, by the way. And uh, she said, now, Rob, um, she said, I lived in the house next to the church building. I didn't have a car. I said, okay. She said, so I had to go to church somewhere, so I decided I'd just go there. I said, well, good. So you went to the, wait a minute, did you tell me you went to the Church of Christ? Yes. I said, well, wonderful. I said, Bettina, I guess you didn't go there very long. Oh, 10 years. 10 years. Uh, uh, Bettina, you probably didn't go, you know, just what, once, twice a year? Every Sunday. Every Sunday for 10 years. Hey, Bettina, while you were going to that Church of Christ every Sunday for 10 years, did anybody... 
Did just one person, did the preacher, did any elder, did anybody ever suggest you might do a Bible study? Nope. But boy, they had good fellowship meals. I have to control my tongue sometimes. Is it okay to get angry? Because you better be. Because that's happening in our churches all over the brotherhood. We've got people sitting in our pews and no one's done a Bible study. And we wonder why we're not growing. That ought never to happen in the church of Christ, but it's happening everywhere. We have people sitting in our pews. No one does a Bible study with them. Six months later, I get a phone call from Rebecca Pearson. Sister Pearson called me. Hey, Rob, I was in Texas. Yes, uh, Rebecca? She said, Rob, uh, we got a problem. I said, what's wrong? She said, Bettina won't move. We were having ladies check on her periodically. She's on oxygen. I said, okay. I said, uh, what's wrong? She said, Rob, I'm shaking her. She's, she's not moving, Rob. Rob, she's blue. I said, have you called 911? She says, I have. She says, Rob, I'm a home health nurse. Uh, Rob, she's, she's not going to make it, Rob. Aren't you glad she didn't go to Ohatchee still? Because that woman would have been lost. I used to not tell the name of that church. I don't hide it anymore. That would be ashamed of themselves. What about visitors? That is one of the best contacts you've got in a church. It's a contact maker. And when those, when those visitors come in and sit down, I tell you what that is. You, brethren, you've got to have a strategic plan of what to do. Now, we don't want the welcome wagon out there scaring them away. I don't want that. Barna did a survey recently, and here was the question they asked. The survey said, uh, what's the number one thing if you're visiting a church that you want when you walk in the door? I want to get some hands going up. Y'all help me. Lance, what would be the, if you, you went to a church, what would be the number one thing you'd want when you visited that church? What would you want? Somebody say hello. All right. That wasn't it. That's a good guess. That, I, I, I would have guessed that. That's exactly what I would say. Anybody else? Anybody want to take a guess? All right, you don't want it? Okay, all right. So the number one thing a visitor wants when they walk in the door is to sit down. <laughs> How'd I miss it? They just want to sit down. They don't want Gabby Gossip coming and telling them all about the problems. They don't want Mr. Grumpy uh, staring at them and, 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 and making faces at them. They just want to sit down. They're embarrassed. They don't, that's all they want. Guess what you should do when a visitor comes? Let them sit down. Let them sit down. Yes, yes, say hello. I, I, yes. But don't give them the third degree at the door. Now, one, two, three, four. You need about six families in this auditorium. About six families. Elders need to appoint them and train them. And we'll give you the training material. And this is what you need to do. Those six families must be um, not Mr. Grumpy. Um, Y'all don't have a Mr. Grumpy, do you? But it needs to be Mr. Smiley. Where's Mr. Smiley? Right there. It needs to be Mr. Smiley. He sees Smiley. We need to get Mr. Smiley and his wife, and we need to train six Mr. Smileys. And Mr. Smiley, what he's going to do when they sit down, honey, Kat, uh, what's your wife's name? Uh, Alex, come, come, come. We, we, we're going to sit over here today. And so let, let's just, can we role play just for a minute? Y'all, we're going to role play. So here it is. He's a visitor. All right. Hey, hey, my name, my name is Rob. Uh, my wife, Nicole, well, what's your name, son? Josh. Josh, what's your wife's name? Allie. Nice to have y'all. Y'all. Y'all visiting from the community here? Well, it's great to have you guys. Uh, uh, we're, hey, I've got something I've got to give you guys. Just, I'll be right back. So we're going to go, and my wife right now is teaching your ladies how to go shopping in the name of the Lord. Thank God you don't have to do this. But the ladies love to do this. They love to go shopping, so they're going to go shopping again. And so we're going to make visitor bags, and we're going to, we're going to put them somewhere selective under pews, and I'm going to get one and bring it back to you, and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to sit there the whole service with you, and... Um, now, our church has made this little visitor bag, and we've got some cups and uh, some uh, other things, uh, Bibles, tissues, uh, pot holders, whatever women like to make. And we've got, sir, um, do you mind if I get your address so we could send a card thanking you for coming? Guess how many times he allows me to fill that card out? Every time. Now, once I fill that card out, he's a contact. He's not a contact until I got the card. He's just a visitor. This is what we typically do in the church. Welcome to the Fayette Church of Christ this morning. If you're visiting with us, you're our honored guest. There is a card in the pew back in front of you. If you'll take that card out and fill it out and put it in the collection plate, uh, someone will pick it up. How many visitors fill out the card? I get the card every time. 
Brethren, if you allow a visitor to walk into your church building and leave and you don't get the contact information, you have failed. I guarantee the dentist doesn't allow that to happen. When that patient walks in, that, that secretary got all that information, and if she doesn't get that information, she's fired. We ought to get that information. And by the way, when I'm sitting with you and we're talking, guess what I'm going to extend as soon as the amen said, hey, we got this custom here. There's this great little restaurant down the street. It looks like a Wendy's. It's a red-headed lady on a sign. What's that place called? Red's. Great place to eat. I don't know if it is or not. We'd like to take you this morning. We're going to take you out to eat. So those six families have a job, a mission. We're going to train them. And by the way, hey, Caleb, I got this visitor over here. Says they'd like to go out to eat. Would you join us? Now, of course, Caleb will. Now, my goal is to transition from me to Caleb because Caleb's going to do a Bible study. Just a matter of time. Sir? Oh, for Caleb, oh, Caleb's going to pay. Okay, well, <laughs> and the preacher always pays, right? All right. That's just, um, let me give you an application. All right. This is a, by the way, I'm going to be done in about five minutes. So I, I spend most of my time on point five. Um, this is Keith Ritchie. He's our new preacher at Jacksonville. Alan, he, he resigned from pulpit preaching. He's now teaching at the Memphis School of Preaching. Thank God. He's a good instructor. He uh, directs Polishing the Pulpit house to house, and we hired Keith Ritchie at Jacksonville. Keith is an incredible preacher. He's been through our school twice. This is his first Sunday. This is his first Sunday. The elders said, Rob, are you going to happen to be home the first Sunday? Keith's going to be here. I said, I think I am. They said, well, we'd like you to be home if you could. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in my pew, and I've been gone three Sundays, and I look back, and there's this, uh, there's this couple. And uh, they're sitting in the back. And, um, and I said, well, man, uh, hmm. I said, uh, I said, that's a visitor. Hey, Eric, 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 who, who is that back there? Sitting back. Oh, they're visitors, Rob. I said, well, good, good. Have they been coming? Oh, last couple weeks. Oh, wonderful. I said, I'm really getting excited. Uh, Eric, uh, did we give them the visitor bag? Oh, we forgot. My blood pressure went up 10 points. That's okay. We're going to go to number two. Um, Mike, Mike's also in our visitor team. Mike. Who is that back there? Oh, yeah, those are visitors. I've been coming since you've been gone. Wonderful. I said, have we given them the visitor bag? Oh, Rob, we were waiting for you to get back. My blood pressure went up 10 more points. And at that point, I decided, forget this. I'm going to do it myself. So I just walked down the aisle, and I sat down there with, hello, my name's Rob. What's your name? Oh, my name's Rick, my wife, Tony. Nice to meet y'all. Little girl right there. Nice, nice to meet y'all. And um, uh, are you guys from the local community? Sure are. We, we, we've been coming here for a couple weeks. Who are you? I said, well, I'm one of the members. I've been, I've been out of town. Oh, well, uh, and I said, well, his name's actually Cameron. I said, Cameron? I said, uh, I said you know what? I said, uh, we got this little visitor bag. I don't think that's been given. No, oh, well, that's really nice. Got a, that's really nice. I said, Cameron, would it be okay if I got your address so we could send you some cards thanking you? Well, yeah, we'd like to do that. And I said, I said well, thank you, Cameron. I said, well, we'll sit with you today. You know, I'll be right back. Keith Ritchie, where is he? All right, Keith. Hey, Keith, that family back here. I said, there's a visitor. He said, Rob, they're all visitors to me. I said, I know. He's, it's first Sunday. I said, but that family right there is a visiting family. I said, Keith, here's the contact card. He says, I know what you want me to do, Rob. I said, I do. He said, I'll go invite him out to eat. I said, we always invite people out to eat. And he did. First, this is his first Sunday at Jacksonville. He takes him out to eat. Mexican restaurant, surely. You're in Alabama, so I know you have a Mexican restaurant. Not have hamburgers, but we've got Mexican restaurants. All right, so we got our Mexican restaurant, and, and then the next week, guess what he's doing? Bible study. And then three weeks later, guess what we're doing? We're baptizing. How do you get 17 baptisms in a church of 150 in one year? That's how you do it. We got to take people out to eat, we got to give them in our home, we got to take them to restaurants, we got to spend time with sinners. If you don't spend time with sinners, you won't con no contacts. You know, one of the problems we're facing today in our churches is our members don't have any contacts because they don't make contact with sinners. They don't want to make contact with them. We can use digital media. I've got a lot of training to do on that. That's very, if you do it right, it will produce community outreach. That's alligator sausage and uh, corn on the cob. Believe you me, they're going to come from alligator sausage and shrimp boil. They're coming for that. They won't come for hot dogs. That's called the, this is in your evangelism. All this is in your guidebook, by the way. All this is in your guidebook. 
This is called the purpose of the church. This is the, 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 the evangelistic machine, I call this. Look at it. Let's, let's, we're going to end right here. This is called the evangelistic machine. Here's what we want to do, church. We want to go after everybody who sits in our pew. If you sit in our pew and you're not a child of God, watch out. We're coming. We're going to come. All right, now we got com co compassion cards. We, we're, we got compassion cards, or we're going to flood people with cards. Not one card with 20 signatures. There's always a cheapskate among us. No, we're going to overwhelm them with cards. And then there's going to be uh, visitors. Every visitor that walks in the building, we got a strategic plan to reach them. And now, now we're going to focus on, we're going to do a little door knocking. At least once a year, if not more, we're going to knock on doors strategically. Then we're going to use house to house, heart to heart properly correctly, because it produces contacts when used right. New movers, digital media, benevolence. What happens if we do everything with a purpose of trying to reach lost people? Ephesians chapter 3, 9 and 10, to this intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places, it might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, which is according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed with Christ Jesus our Lord. Brethren, we are not the local soup kitchen. We're the church of Christ. And our job is to save souls and God help us to do it. If we fail in that mission, we cease to be the church of Christ. I'm going to finish these with your elders. I tell you, they work. That'd be my last slide. That's Mount Pleasant, Texas, North Jefferson, Church of Christ. When I got there, the preacher was about to quit. The church could not have been more depressed. Nothing works. This isn't going to work, but we're going to try it. I said, give me all your heart and soul. Pour it in. They baptized 19 people. They were a church of 100 in 12 months. And that was just recently. 19 people. You see what they're holding? It's got a contact bookmark. And I hope and pray, God, that you'll be trained how to use that. That's one of the most effective tools we've got in our school. That will produce almost like nothing else we've got. Just a bookmark. They use it every Sunday. It's not a one-time event. Every Sunday they use the bookmark. They pull it out. And they go through the process. And when you follow the process, it produces. As soon as you stop the process, you stop producing. Brethren, thank you for allowing my family to be with you. God bless you. Thank you to the elders. Thank you. We, we, we truly believe it's been an honor and a blessing to meet you. You have a lot of promise here, a lot of energy. You have an incredible preacher. Keep him. I mean that. Preachers are very hard to find. I get called almost every week from elders. Can you send me a preacher? I said, no. There's got to be preachers out there. I said, they are. You don't want them. Love this church, brother. There's not many like this. This is a great church. And I think together, this community is about to experience something that perhaps they have not experienced in a long time. You can grow. God bless you. The Apostle Paul told the elders at Ephesus, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all of them that are sanctified. May God bless the faith at Church of Christ. Thank you so much for your time and the energy that you've put into this. May we go to God in prayer. Our great Heavenly Father, our good, gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the time that we have, have had this week preparing ourselves to do something that uh, most of us has never done. And we're thankful for Rob and his time and his preparation for this the great work that he does throughout the brotherhood. We pray, Father, that you would bless, his, bless all of his efforts, especially those the 
the congregations who apply this that the borders of your kingdom may uh, broaden. We're so thankful for the blessings that you give to us. We're thankful for your word that we have that we can uh, expand our knowledge to grow in, in uh, knowledge of you that we may carry out your word throughout the community. We're so thankful for this week. We pray that we will make good use of it. We pray that give Rob and his family a safe travel back to their home as well as us as we go our separate ways. And everything you do, continue to bless us. Always be mindful of us that your will be done in all things and not ours. And it's in your son's precious name that we pray. Amen.